I thought you were going to look over that job. Stories of disabled people in the criminal justice system in Ripon in the Victorian era. An exhibition at Ripon Museum Trust, October 2023. The screen shows a letterpress printing plate with metal type that reads, I thought you were going to look over that job and a lino cut of a goose. What is the lived experience of disability? What is its history? What was, what was it like in the crim criminal justice system in the Victorian era and what do we know about the lives of disabled people who encountered it? Is it any different now? What will it be like in the future? What do we hope for? What do we fear? In this artwork, we explore the lives of seven disabled people who encountered the criminal justice system in Ripon for various reasons during the Victorian era. These were ca um, court cases that were heard at Ripon Courthouse and people who were held at Ripon House of Correction. It, it is based on fragments of their lives captured in the census newspapers and police and court reports. In telling these tiny snapshots of her life, we have sought to present a creative and hopefully respectful story. For each person, the following presents a brief summary of their story that we have derived from archive records along with some other further thoughts and feelings from us about how things were and indeed perhaps could be in the future. The screen shows an Andana 5x3 printing press. The artwork is a hanging structure and an arranged display with a video audio backdrop. Presented in the chapel of the police and prison museum, as you enter the room, hanging from the ceiling from left to right are numerous feathers, then charcoal, then hay. Opposite the doorway is a window and a shelf. On this shelf is a hand printed booklet that reads, I thought you were going to look over that job and a print of a goose. Around the booklet is a pile of feathers, coins, burnt wood, some hay, several horseshoes, a piece of cloth ripped from an apron and a bottle with a note in it. Next to the window is a cabinet with three shelves containing an arranged display of various items, information leaflets and prints relating to the seven stories including a screwed up PIP guidance document and a disability rights handbook from 2012. Opposite this cabinet on the other side of the room is a larger cabinet. Inside this hangs goose feathers, hay and charcoal, coins and a tattered PIP assessment form, shreds of a ripped up dirty apron, a domestic violence support service leaflet, a photo of the Me Too movement, envelopes with O oh Brother written on it, horseshoes and some old bottles. Amongst the hanging items are the names of each person plus the words from a haiku three-line poem relating to them. Left of the doorway is a large poster with white text on a back black ground. This is of a conversation captured while the work was being made and is included at the end of the video. The video plays in the background, projected on the far wall, opposite the poster, with the following text read aloud. The screen shows some footage of the exhibition. James Blackburn. Deported nearly, but if supported, perhaps a firefighter. James Blackburn was taken to court on the 8th of January 1890 for burning down Mr Precious's haystack and hut. This serious crime could have meant transportation to Australia, hard labour or even a sentence of death. However, Judge Williamson, taking advice from Police Inspector Booth, sent him to Merton Asylum where he stayed for 24 years combing wool and tending to animals. Booth perhaps knew 
that James had received weekly maintenance payments from the Ripon Union Common Fund until 1889 for not being dangerous to himself or others, of clean habits, but of unsound mind since birth. The video shows a fire burning with an overlay of various hands writing the name Blackburn with charcoal. Mary Megison In desperation, denied separation. Ask for Angela. George Megason was summoned to court in 1892 to pay maintenance for his wife Mary, a lunatic confined in Menston Asylum, which cost nine shillings and threepence per week. The Board of Guardians had asked her husband to contribute two shillings and sixpence per week towards this cost. George said he was willing to maintain his wife at home, but was told that she was not in a fit state in which to leave the asylum. George also told the court that his wages were only 24 shillings per week and that there were six in the family to live on this and that his children were going downhill. The court ordered George to pay the court the fee. Eight years later, in 1900, Mary summoned her husband to Ripon City Court for a separation order due to persistent cruelty to her. He pleaded not guilty. Mary stated that her and George were quarrelling over money matters when her husband and eldest son came and dragged her into the house and her second son and two daughters brutally ill-treated her while her husband assisted. George completely denied abusing Mary. The court said the evidence did not warrant a separation order and it would be very much better if the couple could live amicably together again. The video shows the ripping of an apron with an overlay of a hand doing the help gesture. The signal is performed by holding your hand up with your thumb tucked into your palm, then folding your fingers down, symbolically trapping your thumb in your fingers. James Hebden The case of the snail, failed by what they said, is his incapacity. Reported in the Darlington and Richmond Herald, Saturday, August 25th, 1877, James Hebden of the Lord Nelson Inn didn't get his licence renewed for having been removed to an asylum. A year later, August 17th, 1878, the Chronicle reports James suing an Anthony Bland of Ripon for the sum of five pounds money being deposited on snail for the Liverpool Cup. Mr Whittam, Bland's lawyer, objected, stating the suing shouldn't be allowed as Hebden was an inmate of the asylum. The judge agreed. The video shows a snail slowly trailing across the screen with an overlay of horseshoes dropping downward on the screen. Mary Harrison O oh brother, they asked, same like the care charges today, give us their money. In 1884, Mary Harrison went into Menston Asylum and the Ripon Union Guardians paid eight shillings and sixpence a week for a keep. Seven years later, in 1891, they sought to reclaim this amount from her savings of forty-six pounds and six shillings and fourpence invested in the post office savings bank. The judge ruled that unless Mary's brother shows cause to the contrary by the eleventh of July, the guardians could claim the money. The video shows a quill being used to write the word O oh, brother on an envelope with an overlay of the hand using the Mackerton sign for brother. Frederick William Jarvis. 
stole a goose, dug the noose, a future trainer of space exploring geese. In November 1920, Frederick was in court for stealing a grey goose. When a police officer saw him at the scene, Frederick struck at him with the goose before being taken to the police station to be charged. Frederick admitted to a further crime of poultry theft. When charged, he said, I thought you were going to look over that job. Was sent to prison for six months with hard labour for both crimes. His first crime in 1895, age 16, was for stealing turnips. His mum described him as a bit wanting, and record, records of him being in an asylum at age nine for an unknown illness state that when his mind was thoroughly employed, he was all right. But if he was not working and had nothing to employ his mind, then he got into mischief. In 1914, Frederick was charged with stealing from a fowl house at Dalamise Lane in Ripon. The police searched his house to find a quantity of feathers corresponding to the colour of all the stolen fowls. Frederick went to prison for 12 months with hard labour. The video shows multiple white feathers hanging and being blown about in the wind. Elizabeth Long Means test Meanly tested, making up the bottom line. So no change here then. Elizabeth Long's husband, John, died the 15th of January, 1893, aged 77. Three days later, she was taken to Menston Asylum. Her son, John Jr., to an asylum in Wakefield. In June that year, Ripon Poor Law Union took legal action to recover £22, 10 shillings and sixpence, roughly £2,000, for fees and costs. John Umpley, the relieving officer, said that she had been to the asylum before and the doctors said she might get better, but that's what they said every time. Mr Gowland, appearing on behalf of the Guardian, said it was a sort of stereotype letter they send. The newspaper reported there was then laughter in the court. The judge ruled that the guardians could claim fees and costs from Elizabeth at £11.04, shillings, but not for her son. Mr Gowland argued the boy was under 14 and under the Poor Law Amendment Act, parents were responsible for their children. The video shows a number of old Victorian pennies being spun on a tattered personal independent payment assessment form. John Wolfe When in liquor, a harsh nickname, eleven times not corrected. Reported in the Chronicle, September the 20th, 1873, John Wolfe had spent 13 months in Mullingar Lunatic Asylum in 1869 as well as having been in Wakefield, Northallerton, Lancaster, Kendall and Beaumaris prisons, and recently for being in All Hallogate, drunk, disorderly, in a state of nudity and wanting to fight a man named Umpleby. He was locked up in Ripon Liberty House of Correction, this being his eleventh time. When in liquor, he acts more like a madman and has got the nickname in Ripon as Mad Jack. The video shows a close-up of some prison bars with an overlay of a bottle being filled with liquid that doesn't stop and continues to overflow. I like to think that we'll be more, what's the word, accepting mm. of differences. Um, that's what's in my head. 
we come need to from celebrate the differences as opposed yes. to labeling them as bad because yeah. you know I mean lots of people they now say oh famous people have had have got this um, autism and famous people have got managed to you know get through their lives despite all the barriers that uh, are here mm. I mean that's kind of we need hope as opposed to it's a downfall yeah in terms of education I would love because education children are taught within a specific you know um, neurotypical framework mm. and any child that steps outside of that with any of these mm. neurodiverse or neurodivergent conditions is seen as different I would love to be able to say that education will be seen as more um, inclusive where difference is the norm you know where yeah, children are taught um through a much wider lens rather than this narrow mm. focus that doesn't fit everybody. So using teachers use diff um, lots of different ways to teach instead of just narrowing it. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't suit anybody because at the moment it's all about statistics. Mm. Yeah. It's not about education, it's not about the kids, it's about numbers and money. If we, as a society, could get away from this incessant need to value everything, then society would be a much better place. But and that's, that's really what we're doing, is we want them to do, we learn things power of fashion. If you ask them a question, they have to have the answer, whether they know, understand, or believe it. Yeah. They just have to say it, and it's like, oh, that's not how the world works. No, and learning with, you said parrot fashion, that's rote memory, so like, if you say things over and over again, you're going to learn it. That's not learning, proper learning, that's just very superficial. Um, yeah, it's... And means tested, that's the other thing, they're testing everyone's ability. Life is a test. But if everybody's taught, assuming that everybody's different and everybody's learned differently, they're not going to see these differences. This artwork was created during September 2023 by Carol Turnbull, Charlie Dunning, Mary Jane Olivier, Margaret Crossfield, Glenn Griffiths, Linda Richardson, Anna Moore, Nicola Bradbury, Stephen Lee Hodgkins and the art makers from Henshaw's Arts and Crafts Centre for Ripon Museum Trust. Special thanks to Jenny Clough, Pat Wilson, Jean Berry, Claire Greensit, John Holmes, Moira Smith and Mark Gronfield for their voice over recording, as well as Andy Bates and Laura Allen, who coordinated and supported the project throughout. The project was funded by the Arts Council. The screen shows an old reel-to-reel -reel tape player. <laughs>